Good morning, this is Gareth Aiden, and I'm here this morning on behalf of the National Bar Association Legal History Project in conjunction with the Tennessee Bar Foundation Project. It's my pleasure this morning to be interviewing one of Nashville's most respected lawyers, Jack Robinson Sr., who happens to be my law partner, so this is a special pleasure. Jack, if you would, in the style of depositions, could you begin by giving us your full name, please? Yes, I'm Jack Wright Robinson, Sr. And uh, what was the date of your birth, please? January 8th, 1934. And my guess is that it was in Carthage? Um, it was in Carthage, Smith County, Tennessee. That's correct. <laughs> if you could tell us a little bit about um, your family, uh, beginning with your parents and your grandparents. Okay. Uh, my parents, uh, both of them were born and raised on farms in uh, Smith County. Uh, they had two sons. In addition to me, I had an older brother, 11 years older, uh, and uh, he's deceased, died a few years ago. And uh, my father was, um, he was uh, served a term as trustee of Smith County at an early age, and then uh, later was the um, automobile dealer there, the Ford dealer there. And my brother later was in the Chevrolet business. And so we've been uh, tied into automobiles uh, for a long time there, but uh, no longer. Did um, you spend your childhood in Carthage? Uh, yes. Um, I went to elementary school there for eight years. And uh, then starting high school, I um, went to Castle Heights Military Academy. That was in uh, Lebanon. Mm -hmm. That was a uh, boys' school that had started in uh, 1902, and, uh, but it's no longer in existence, and I stayed four years there. I was not a day student. I, I, I boarded there also. What were the years of your period at Castle Heights? That was from 1948 to 1952. Tell us a little bit about Castle Heights. I remember as a youth hearing about the school, but I never knew much about it. Tell us some about it and how you did there. Well, as I say, it was a military school and um, had about, uh, in uh, the senior school, probably about 500 and had a junior school probably with two or 300 in it. And uh, the final year, I was a uh, cadet captain and was the uh, uh, commander of the band company. And uh, they had, uh, I guess, four or five companies there divided up, but we were the only ones that played instruments. <laughs> and I played a trumpet, not as well as the rest of them, but I did that. And I was the, uh, the junior year, I was the drum major of that. Uh, one of the highlights of that, I would say, is that when uh, General MacArthur was removed from duty by President Truman, uh, he came uh, back to this country and his wife uh, was from, from Murfreesboro. So there was a big homecoming for him over there. And our band was, stash was uh, stationed on top of the little hotel over Murfreesboro, and uh, we played for him as he came in, you know, a highlight. That is a memory. Did and you board at Castle Heights? I did, uh-huh. And then uh, I got involved and interested in, um, in the news, in newspaper world there. Tell us in, about in that. journalism. And uh, we had a um, newspaper there called The Cavalier that even uh, for many years before my time always took the top honors of the nation. It looked like the Tennessean, that large and so forth. And I was the, um, uh, an editor in my junior year and the editor-in-chief my, uh, my senior year. We continued to get you know, the usual honors. And so I really got uh, printer's ink on my, on my hands, and, and it stuck for a while. When did you graduate from Castle Heights? In uh, May 1952. And where did you head for college? Well, uh, Vanderbilt didn't have anything like journalism at that time, but the University of Tennessee did. And uh, so I went there and uh, entered in the summer of 1952, and I finished in uh, three years in 1955. While I was there, uh, I worked uh, not only had a small journalism department, I was uh, in that, uh, taking what courses I had, and I was the anonymous grader for that department, which meant I graded my colleagues' papers without their knowing it. I got paid for it. <laughs> And uh, the professors graded mine. I got paid, so that worked out well. 
And uh, apparently I was not a hard grader. I didn't hear any complaints. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Jack, when you... Um, I also was in the ROTC and got a commission when I finished there. I was going to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, in terms of, um, of um, major, sort of how, how did you do and what courses did you center on? It? Okay. You Interesting, as I say, the uh, journalism school was... Um, small at that time and so there are very there are certain journalism courses but not too many so as a result I had a lot of electives I could take so I took a lot of electives in the business college I took a lot of electives in the uh, in the uh, uh, liberal arts college from geology to economics to political science to philosophy you know all the way around it's just a really good uh, well-rounded uh, education and uh, I was the last person who graduated uh, at U from UT uh, with a um, with a bachelor's degree uh, with a business degree with a major in journalism. The uh, journalism school was in the business college, and they changed that the year before. And uh, they wanted to know if I wanted to change that, you know, to get a journalism uh, degree. And I said, no, I prefer just to stay like it is. So I have the unusual thing of having a degree in business, but with a major in journalism. While you were in college, were you a single or did you marry during college? Uh, I married, Claudine and I married while I was in college. And uh, the last year, uh, she went to school up there too, along with me. Where had you met Claudine? I met her in Lebanon, where Castle Heights is located. And um, the, uh, I guess I had met her probably in my, probably early in my junior year. Eck, you mentioned that you were you remained um, in the ROTC while you were at the University of Tennessee. Did you follow up in the reserves? Yeah, I had to. Um, I had uh, you had an eight year reserve obligation, of which uh, two years was to be on active duty. So when I graduated from uh, University of Tennessee, I had uh, I think it was seven or eight months before I was called into service. I knew where I was going. I had my orders. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, the Korean War was over, and uh, we had more second lieutenants than needed. And uh, really unknown to me till I got there, my orders had been cut down to six months, which was okay. So I served six months at Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indiana, and, uh, which was the Army of Finance and, uh, and the uh, uh, General Services School. And I believe you told me you eventually um, uh, moved out of the military as a captain. And yeah, and then when I when, uh, finished there, I went back into active reserves and attending uh, uh, weekly meetings and then ultimately got to, to weekend uh, sessions once a month. And I retired after eight years uh, as, as a captain, yes. Okay. So uh, here we are, I guess, in about 1956 or 57. Your active uh, duty is um, your active duty is over. What what did you decide to do? Well, um, I worked in. Uh, let's see, that was in yeah. I got a uh, before I before I went there. Uh, when I finished, uh, I had uh, before I went into the service, I had um, I had worked in uh, for a newspaper in Covington, Tennessee, right north of uh, right north of uh, Memphis. And uh, since it was only six months, they held it open for me. And uh, I went back there, and uh, and liked it. Uh, our house was just two two blocks up the street, and I'd go home. Uh, for lunch every day, and I did what I'd like to do, editing a paper, and we did well there. But I hadn't been back but two or three weeks. I got a call from uh, uh, Albert Gore, Senator Albert Gore Sr. He said, well, I hear you back out of the Army, and why don't you come up here and work for me? And uh, I said, I really, really not yeah, appreciate it, but I'm really not interested in it. I'm back over here. They've held this open for me and so forth, and that passed pretty well. And then. And then uh, I got a call in three or four weeks from my father. What? You, I understand that you got a call. <laughs> and so he started working on my father. And ultimately then uh, I had the uh, sad duty of saying just having arrived back here from the Army, after a few weeks I'm leaving. 
<laughs> uh, Chloe and I decided that um, we'd go up there for you know for two years. It'd be good experience. I don't know what for, but uh, it'd be good experience. So we went up for two years, but we stayed until eight years. Now, by way of background to that to that pretty fateful telephone call from Senator Gore, I believe he was from Carthage. That's is correct. that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And had your family known the Gore family oh, yeah. as you grew up? Yeah, very well. He had known me since I was born. And um, uh, he and my father ran for uh, public office up there the first time. And my father, as I say, was elected, and that was the only, and he and Senator Gore ran for a superintendent of schools, and that was the only, that was the only race he was defeated in except for the Senate race in 1970. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Now, after he, after he ran for superintendent of schools, what did he next run for to sort of get his career going? Do you recall? Yeah. He, um, he was involved in Gordon, Gordon Browning's election for governor. This is in the late 30s, about 1938 probably. And uh, so uh, when Browning was elected, um, Gore incidentally was superintendent of schools at that time. The fellow that he had run against uh, and had defeated him, named Mr. Huffines, um, Gore never mentioned his name during the campaign and always said nice things about him. So it wasn't too long after that election was over that Mr. Huffines died, and the county court elected Gore then superintendent of schools. How about that? So uh, he was superintendent of schools, and um, and then Browning, uh, new governor Browning, asked him to be his commissioner of labor. Now, uh, Smith County was not a rabid labor market, you know, and I'm not sure what he knew about it, if anything. Uh, maybe like being postmaster general, you know. <laughs> but anyway, he came to uh, Nashville, and during that time, he went to Knight Law School at the uh, what was then the YMCA Knight Law School, now the Nashville School of Law. And um, and then um, there was the congressman was a fellow named Ridley Mitchell that had been up there a long time. And all of a sudden, this was really 1938, he decided he wasn't going to run for Congress. And Gore threw his hat in the ring, and he was elected. And uh, he served for us, uh, after that time, he served for seven terms, that's 14 years in the House of Representatives, wow. and three terms in the Senate, which is another 18 years. Well, that's a fascinating background. Thank you for taking a minute to sort of run down that alley. Coming back to where we were, um, Senator Gore has prevailed on you and your father to get you to go to Washington. Right. Tell us what your job was and and a little bit about how that went. Well, I'd say my primary job was to, uh, was to get the mail out. We had a staff there, and a lot of mail would come in. A lot of telegrams would come in. That's a days. And there were, uh, I know the interstate highway uh, program was being considered at that time. The garden clubs were interested in it. Mm -hmm. the business people were interested in it. A lot of other things were happening. And so really like to get the mail out, you know, within the day or two after it came in. And I'm talking about hundreds of letters a day. Uh, in addition... Uh, to the extent that he had one, I handled the press for Gore, and uh, with the, uh, uh, particularly the Tennessee newspaper people that were there. And at that time, uh, the major newspapers had uh, correspondents uh, stationed permanently in Washington. That's not true anymore. And other things, you know, that came up that needed to be done, uh, wrote some speeches, but uh, primarily what I've told you. Jack, in... Um in those days, how large was the senator's staff? Uh, we had uh, 12 uh, people, that was it, in Washington and, uh, in, and had no offices in the state. Uh, in the summertime, or after the session was over, I guess in the fall, he and I would come back to Carthage. We had a little office there, and uh, one of the secretaries would come back with us. How about that? In terms of... Um your stay as chief of staff for Senator Gore, how long did that last? Uh, almost eight years. Almost eight years. I know you must have a hundred or a thousand great stories about Washington, but well, first share with us a little bit about Senator Gore, what he was like and what his, um, what his political viewpoints were. Well, uh, he was... Um uh, I always admired his uh, integrity. This is not something you can tell people and you win elections on, but, uh, you know, uh, for instance, when, um, uh, if um, 
somebody would write him and, uh, and about legislation and uh, in signing the letter he'd put a PS, a personal thing on there, you know, he'd always insist that there be a stamp put on that. Mm -hmm. Do not use the Franken privilege. You know, I'm not sure anybody else did that. But he was really a stickler for that sort of thing. Fascinating. And uh, he was, a, he was a, a guy that was appreciative. Since I'd known him a long time, longer certainly than any of the rest of them that didn't have that association, uh, if he had whatever he needed to have done, uh, he didn't mind asking me. Whereas, he, you know, he didn't like to, he, 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 he hesitated a lot of times when he wanted to ask somebody else to do something for him. And uh, so it was, a, it was a good relationship. And he was, uh, uh, there, there was always a um, race each morning who could get there first, uh, him or, or me. And the rest of them would come in a little later, you know. But both of us were early risers. Uh, he, he was always uh, part of the soil. He never forgot that he's back from Smith County and, and he always had a farm there. And, uh, and uh, he took the position that the uh, people elected him uh, to uh, seriously study things, which he did. He was always prepared and do the best he could do. And it didn't worry him that somebody disagreed with him because he says, well, Jack, they don't know, they don't have the background on this. Uh, I remember one interesting thing that uh, just occurred to me. He had a very had a close friend uh, that in a small town out from um, out from um, Memphis, and something he voted on it just really excited that guy. And he wrote him he, this telegram up there, just really, really, just just cussing him out, you know. <laughs> and I wondered how in the world is he going to handle this? And he wrote him a letter, dear so and so. I just wanted you to know somebody sent a telegram up here using your name and I know that you'd want to know about it. <laughs> so he had a sense of humor. Tell us some of your favorite memories of working as an aide to Senator Gore for those eight years. Well, um, Gore was on the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which was pretty heady back then. Uh, he didn't care to go to the uh, uh, parties at the embassies and uh, all those kind of things. So I remember soon after I came up there, um, Eisenhower was nominated for his second term. And uh, of course Gore had uh, two uh, honored tickets right next to the courthouse, to uh, right next to the White House to uh, look at the parade and didn't want to use them. So he says, why don't you and Claudine use those? So that was uh, a beginning activity that was pretty good. And uh, when people uh, uh, from time to time, leaders would uh, come to this country and a lot of times they'd wind up at the Senate uh, meeting with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And uh, I'd get calls from time to time frequently when that happened, uh, Jack, or I left so-and-so over there, will you bring it over there to me? And that's so he could introduce me to them, like, a, uh, oh, wonderful. like yeah. the Chancellor of Germany or, or someone like that. So, you know, that's, uh, that's, uh, that was interesting. And uh, also, um, when um, Kennedy was um, was, uh, was assassinated, I got a call from him. He was on the floor of the Senate, and he says, uh, uh, "Jack, uh, the president's been shot." I said, "Oh, you're kidding me!" No, I'm not. I'm standing right here by the ticker, the news ticker, you know. Mm -hmm. And that that was the first news that that I had. And then, uh, and then, of course, uh, Lyndon Johnson was uh, took the oath of office in. Uh, Dallas as the president came back to Washington. It was a stirry, it was a unquietening time in Washington and other places as well. And uh, during the time that he was a uh, majority leader, that uh, Johnson was majority leader, uh, he and Gore were not really, they were, they came up to Congress at the same time, but uh, they were both very independent. And uh, Johnson liked to uh, liked to govern others, and Gore didn't like that and wouldn't let him. So they they split up a lot of the times. And about uh, three days uh, after Johnson had been in the, back in the White House as a new president, and of course uh, Gore always called him Albert. He, he he came in one day and he says, "Jack, the president wants to see me," and that means drive with me down to the White House, which I did and parked in the uh, uh, south a lot there, and he says, I won't be long, just stay right here. And so, sure enough, he wasn't too long, and he came back, and I said, well, what did, uh, what did uh, Johnson say? 
He said, what did the president say? I said, yes. He said, um, he said um, well, Albert, uh, both of those, both of us were old school teachers. So what I'd like to do, let's just wipe the slate clean. And I said, uh, what did you say? He said, Mr. President, I'm glad to do that. And then it wasn't three days later that there were, there were barbs between them, you know. Same old, same old situation. During this period, um, Jack was um, Senator Gore, the senior sen senator from Tennessee. Uh, during the latter time I was there, uh, Estes Kefauver was a senior senator until, until his death. Well, I had wondered how they got along together. I, I, you hear a lot about Estes mm -hmm. Kefauver. Got along fine, but each office up there in the Senate, there's a hundred of them, is, is a little fiefdom. And there's not much relationship between the offices. Now, when, they, um, when uh, there were vacancies, statewide federal vacancies to be filled, like in Tennessee, they would have to get their heads together and make joint recommendations. But other than that, not too much uh, reaction between the offices. But uh, he and... Uh, he and Keith Offer were completely different people, uh, but uh, you know, got along well. Jack, am I right that during the eight years that um, you served as chief of staff for Senator Gore, you also went to law school? Yep, that's right. Tell us about that. Well, how that happened during um, during Gore's uh, 1958 campaign for re-election in Tennessee. Uh, one of his close friends, Harry Phillips was the campaign manager. And I came to Tennessee during that time, and spent several months uh, in the, uh, I think it was in the Hermitage Hotel here. And uh, Phillips would be there from time to time during the day, and he would be there at night. And um, uh, we were all that Albert Gore had, and we were pretty slim. <laughs> <laughs> and so we all had a lot of, uh, I got to get know uh, Phillips uh, well at that time. And he's always saying, uh, Jack, you need to go to law school. Now, Phillips had a background of, uh, of liking journalism, too, and he was a school newspaper editor, and he was going to follow that career until the Depression uh, came in, uh, into being. And so one night I finally I said, well, I will, I will. Then I go back to Washington, and he keeps, you said you were going to. And uh, I found out how you get in. You took something called the LSAT, which is sort of new at that time. And... Um, and so uh, got into, uh, and then went to George Washington University. Um, and uh, this was a, uh, they, Harvard and George Washington at that time, and I think continues to be so, uh, have a contest as who has the most law students. And uh, so they had a night program too, so quite a few of my classes were taken at night, you know, not only for my benefit, but for the others who worked in the Pentagon and the various agencies, and that sort of thing. So when I was in Washington, uh, I would be going to school when I when I needed to go to Tennessee. I would take off, but I I finished there and graduated in 1963. And uh, Gore's re-election was coming up in 1964, and I said that I would stay with him uh, through the primary through September 1964, which I did. When you went to um, George Washington, Jack, did you go to school with anyone who's gone on to have sort of a an outstanding or famous career? Did you? Have others that were there uh, in your class that uh, probably so. I can't recall any right now. I do recall that uh, during our moot, moot court competition, so forth, that we'd have during the school year, that uh, we would have uh, federal judges. A lot of times, the appellate judges were always our judges, and then the final one would be one or two or three from the Supreme Court. Wow, be our judges. So that was uh, that was uh, an extra plus for being in Washington. Now I'm going to check up on you. How did you do in your grades? I, I didn't realize I was doing as I didn't keep up with them because I had a lot of, I worked about 50 hours a week in addition to that. But uh, on, uh, they came in and they said, um, uh, you've been nominated for law review. And I said, really, I, I, I'm not sure exactly what that is, but I don't have time for that. <laughs> and I said, what is the, uh, what is the, uh, what's, what's that all about? And they said, well, you've got to be order of, Coif. And I said, tell me about that. And they did. They explained that was in the top 10%. And uh, so at least I was in the top 10%. Very good. Came, which came as a surprise to me, I might say. When did you graduate from law school? I graduated in uh, 1963. And was that about the same time that you were, you were getting ready to resign from a service with Senator Gore? Uh, no, that was a year later. That's, okay. that's the time that he and I talked, and I told him that I would stay through <laughs> Um, 
through September of 1964. Very good. Stay, stay another year. Well, let's um, let's now go to um, the period of time after you had graduated from law school and after you had um, stepped down as chief of staff for Senator Gore. And let's drop back for a minute. Uh, I know that you and Claudine had now been married for a couple of years. Tell me about your family and how that was coming along. Well, by that time, Jack Jr. had been born and uh, was about uh, five years old. And uh, we wanted to get back to uh, Tennessee to raise a family here. And uh, so I uh, came back and started at this law firm, uh, only firm I've ever been with, 40 seven years now, I guess, and um, in uh, September, or rather it be October the 1st, 19 and, uh, 1964, uh, I came down to interview with, with this firm. In the meantime, it always sort of understood uh, maybe that uh, Judge Phillips and I would practice law together. He was a member of this firm. But the year before I came, uh, he was appointed to the um, United States uh, Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. And so I came down and was interviewed by B.B. Uh, Gullett and Thomas Wardlaw Steele and Val Sanford. They couldn't understand why I'd want to come down here anyway, because I was offered $500 a week, uh, $500 a month. <laughs> Exorbitant. Exorbitant to start practicing law, and I was making uh, several <laughs> times that there, maybe three times or four times there, I'm not sure of that. And I said, well, you know, that's my problem and not yours. Uh, and coming down, I really don't always, but I have no problem with this. I can, we can handle it all right, you know. And uh, a little snobbish about that, I guess. And uh, so came down, and um, the rest is history. <laughs> it is indeed. Tell us about B. Gullett and Val Sanford in those days. Yeah. Well, uh, Gullett is uh, one of the three people that I call as my cheerleaders. Uh, the other one, well, the other two was, were Albert Gore and Harry Phillips, as you might imagine. And the cheerleaders are the ones that think you can do no wrong, and they keep encouraging you. A lot of people would call them mentors. And I did learn a lot from them. I learned from B.B. Uh, Gullett, uh, the art of, of uh, pursuit. If he got on a case, he would pursue that. If he didn't know the answer, he would call up who did. And uh, to just pursuit all the way. Uh, never stop. And uh, that was a big thing that I learned from him. Uh, I learned from uh, Gore preparation, and I learned, uh, or I should say, I learned from Phillips preparation. He just really prepared whatever he did, and I learned from Gore presentation. But um, Gullett, as you know and as recall, was a great storyteller, and enjoyed uh, uh, telling uh, long, involved stories. And he was uh, he was quite good at it. One example, I. Uh, he was from uh, over in rural uh, southern Tennessee, and he was telling about a uh, guy came home from the uh, service, and he'd been nicked in the nose by a bullet right you know, near the end of the service. And so the old fellows were in the, in the courthouse yard there playing uh, checkers and, and chewing tobacco, and uh, they came in, and they said, Joe, they nearly got you, didn't they? He said, no. They nearly missed me. <laughs> that's kind of a gullet story, you know. <laughs> well, now that's the gullet of gullet Sanford Robinson uh, and Martin. What about the Sanford? Yeah. Well, uh, as far as law goes, Sanford took me under his wing when I got here. Uh, Sanford at that time was a business lawyer. He had been a partner uh, to uh, Frank Clement, who was, um, I think, then governor. He was governor a couple of times. And he, had, uh, he was involved in representing a lot of corporations that involved a lot of corporate minutes, that type of thing. And he got me involved in that. And so he slowly got away from that end, Val did, and got more and more into litigation. And I see. That's what I started doing. I see. Who else besides um, Val Sanford and B. Gullett uh, were in the firm when you began? At that time, there were three others, Thomas Wardlaw Steele, Steele and a, a, a uh, chancellor, uh, the only uh, judge uh, lower than the U.S. Supreme Court that, uh, that decided Baker versus Carr, as it ultimately turned out. And uh, he was uh, 
he was uh, he was really quite a lawyer. And um, and then uh, there was uh, Charles Hampton White, who is uh, now retired and ultimately was a labor lawyer. And there was um, Harold Bigham. And incidentally, those two and I had lunch together last Thursday. Uh, Harold uh, was the firm for a good while here. He was a professor at Vanderbilt Law School after that. And then he retired about five years ago as a professor at uh, Pepperdine Law School in California. So there was, there was those, uh, I guess it would be up six of us in all. In those first years when uh, you were making so much money at the firm, $500, gosh, a month, Tell us a little bit about the type of practice that the firm had and what was interesting to you and sort of how your, your career developed. Well, as a low man on the totem pole, I did whatever others didn't want to do or whatever needed to be done. And the firm had a lot of automobile accident cases at that time. Insurance companies were not as adept in settling cases. And so these were all tried before jury. And Gullett did that, and certainly Thomas Wardlaw still did that, and Val got into doing that also. And uh, this was in the days of the old pleading rules in Tennessee, where instead of having a complaint that the jury never saw, there was a long declaration which you read to the jury. And you had to make it as, uh, as uh, <laughs> scary as you possibly could. And, uh, you know, having a background as a writer, uh, I've just do... Uh, oh, dozens of those sometime a month. And they would go on for eight and ten legal sized pages and whoever was trying the case they would talk about all the excruciating pain that this poor woman suffered as a result of this accident. And uh, so I did a lot of that. And then uh, after a while, as you know, the rules changed and we, know we no longer had that. And I re really, uh, I, I enjoyed that. And then, as I said, I had the corporate practice that I got in, right. involved in. I didn't do much, I've never done much trial work, which is probably a disappointment to me. But it wasn't necessary for me to do that because everybody else did the other things and really didn't want to do what I was doing. Right. There must have been a fateful day when somehow Jack Robinson Sr. met up with Pritchard on Wills. Yep. How did that happen? Well, Pritchard, the latest... Uh, volumes are right here on, the, on my uh, desk. Uh, Harry Phillips, uh, back uh, years before, had resurrected a treatise on Tennessee wills and state that a fellow named, a uh, lawyer named Pritchard, who lived in Chattanooga, had compiled very well. And uh, it had been out of date, and uh, nobody had seen or heard of it for several years. And, uh, and he had uh, taken a long time to resurrect that. And about 10 years had gone by, and he had, he had, uh, Judge Phillips had gone on the, on the bench. And he said, you know, I'd like to do that one more time, and, but uh, I can't do it by myself. Mm -hmm. This is a federal judge talking, you understand. I can't do it by myself, and I, I want you to help me. And I was just as busy as I could be, and I said, well, uh, Judge, you know, I don't know too much about it, but uh, I'll be, be glad to help you and do what I can. I mean, I, I owed him a lot, I thought. And uh, so, um, uh, and uh, he, he already had his part done before I even, and I started a, a year later. There was really so much going on here. And uh, so he asked me to do it, and then, and then it came out, and he put my name on the book as well as, as his. And that's how I got started in doing Pritchard. And I know that I became a uh, probate authority almost overnight with that publication. <laughs> I think that's true because I even that is to... certainly your, one of your real profiles in the bar is as an expert in probate. I practice. think that's right. And Gareth, I had to start reading it, you know, to see what it said. But um, I, uh, but I learned a lot in doing that. Uh, and uh, so we pretty much divided. He did the wills part, and I did the probate part, and then, and then. Um, and then since that time, uh, we have uh, kept that up, and, uh, and we last did it, uh, uh, revised it last year. So I have been uh, an editor of that for the last, uh, or an author of that for the last uh, four printings, four uh, series, I guess. Uh, uh, so basically, that's been a period of, um, what, 40, yeah, 40 I guess, years? Yeah, I guess that, yeah, 
you know, about that time. You Your know, name about 40 is years. synonymous now with the publication. Did you begin getting calls from across the state? Yeah, to... that's the that's the only um, only book of that nature. Uh, those three volumes that are that are on that subject in Tennessee, and uh, lawyers uh, uh, cite it, judges cite it. I know when uh, when I was young and appeared before uh, uh, Judge Luton over the probate court, and somebody would know something, he'd say, "Well, let me ask you, what does Pritchard say about it?" You know that sort of thing. <laughs> and I would, I'd get, and I still get calls. Uh, to usually average a couple of calls a week from law now from lawyers across the state, you know, and said. Uh, you know, uh, I can't find this, or what do you think about this? A lot of times, because they can't find it, because there's not been a reported case. And because uh, we don't really editorialize all that much in uh, Pritchard, but we report, you know, what the law is right. as, as announced by the court. And then uh, from time to time, I, w I get, uh, uh, not as much lately, but I would get a, a call from, from a judge to clarify, you know, what something meant in the new law or something of that nature. So. Uh, and I'm glad, you know, I could I could help people out. I didn't I didn't talk about it who I got calls from, but uh, it worked out. <laughs> In the last few years, um, you know, as as you have uh, reached or are getting toward a, a retirement time, have you had any help with your work in editor editing Pritchards? Yeah, uh, Jeff Mobley, who used to be with this firm, who has his own firm now, and Andrew Hedrick. Uh, who's right next door to me and right. who does uh, this type of work full time. Right. Now, all during my time of practicing law, I've never done probate law exclusively. Uh, I've done a good bit of real estate law. I've done a good bit of uh, corporate or commercial law and still do that. Now, to a lesser extent. And since I come in just parts of two days a week now, what I do generally is not take on new clients as they call or uh, they're referred to other people. And, uh, but the old clients, I thought it wouldn't, uh, I, I, I still stick with them. And when I'm home, I take business calls home and I'll get from two to six or eight, you know, during any one day, which I'm glad to get. And I do a good bit of legal reading and also some uh, drafting there at home. And uh, as I say, that's not necessarily confined to probate stuff, although that's my emphasis now. If you don't mind, I'd l I would like to loop back for just a moment and let me ask you about one other person that I think is, has obviously been influential in your life, and that's um, Judge Harry Phillips. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what his career was like and what he was like as an attorney and a person. Mm -hmm. uh, Judge uh, Phillips uh, was from Wilson County, Watertown, and uh, Tom Forrester, who is a member of this firm, I'm going to tell you something involving his grandfather, who was, a, who was a lawyer in Watertown. I mentioned earlier that Judge Phillips had always been interested in writing, and uh, right before he uh, got out of, the year before he was to get out of college, he was the editor of the, uh, of the college paper, he determined what he thought was the best newspaper in Tennessee that happened to be the Chattanooga Times at that time. He went over there to get a job when he got out, and they hired him subject is getting out of college in a year. In the meantime, the depression hit. Uh, they started laying off reporters and they certainly couldn't hire him. There was nothing else to do except to do, what, what does he do? And, law, and uh, Cumberland happened to have a law school, so he started a law school. And in due course, he finished. And the, the depression was still on and didn't know what to do. And, um, and the Mr. Forrester was practicing law at Watertown. And he says, Harry, uh, I've got an extra desk over here. You can uh, come over here and uh, use it if you like. Don't charge you anything. And uh, it was not a county seat town, so there wasn't much happening. And so he came over. And the first time in, the first day there, according to what Judge Phillips told me, he said, Harry, if you're going to be a lawyer, you've got to look like a lawyer. Take this $5 bill and go over there and buy you a hat. <laughs> and, uh, but Phillips was very proper. Uh, to other people, he'd refer to his wife as Mrs. Phillips. And uh, he was very exacting and just a very honorable fellow, always prepared. Uh, if, if, if you had a good case today, he's not sure where one would be coming from tomorrow. And uh, he was, um, he was um, one of three uh, assistant state attorney generals. They only had three at the time he was there. Wow. In Tennessee, plus the attorney general. And uh, he and uh, Harry Phillips 
and Weldon White started this law firm in the 1950s. <clears throat> in, um, in, after JFK was elected president, uh, there was an opportunity to appoint a um, federal judge in, in, in Nashville here. And Kefauver and um, Gore got together on it. It was decided that Gore's recommendation would lead. And so he, uh, Gore said, I'm going to call Harry. He'd make a good judge. He just, and I said, he really would, you know. So he called him. And uh, so Phillips says, I'm going to have to let you know about this. And it developed that Phillips went down to the, to the federal court to hear a session and of criminal law. <clears throat> and he came back and called Gore. He said, I just can't take that. I just don't believe I could. I just, I just couldn't sentence people like that. And so a couple years later, uh, another vacancy came open, which was on the, the appellate court in Cincinnati, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. And so Senator Gore came in one day. Well, I've got, he was never big on patronage. <coughs> but he said, I've got this to, to uh, recommend to the uh, Justice Department, and uh, I don't know who. I said, well, I just know who. Harry, well, Harry will not take it. You heard what he said. I said, yeah, but you remember the condition. I said, this is not criminal law. They just, you know, they do appellate work. So he called him and he took it. So from 1963 on until his death, uh, he was killed in an automobile accident. As a pedestrian in London, a number of years later, uh, he was, uh, he'd served as, as chief justice, uh, chief uh, judge up there, as you know, and was very well respected at a, had a, large, uh, a large funeral here where all those judges and many others attended. I remember that was a <coughs> tragic event, and it, I think it happens with Americans. He, he had looked the wrong way as he was going to cross the street. That's correct. Looked right instead of left. Exactly. And uh, it was not the driver's fault. Jack, let's, um, let's move along now into the, um, into the 1970s and 80s. Tell us a little bit about the, uh, the growth of the law firm and... Um, uh, how your practice was progressing? Well, we began to uh, handle more different types of law, and um, Metropolitan Federal, which was a savings loan association, a type of bank, uh, became quite uh, large at that time, and that demanded uh, uh, a lot of our time. And about uh, three or four, this is this would be starting about uh, 1983. Uh, would uh, spend a lot of time working with Metropolitan Federal on closing their commercial loans, on uh, doing a lot of other things with them. We were in the same building with them, so that made it very convenient. And then uh, the, uh, the country economically uh, was, was taking off, and, uh, and there was a lot of uh, law practice, even though there were many, many new lawyers coming to Nashville as well as other places. It seems that uh, they were not outgrowing the number of uh, law cases and law matters available. And um, uh, Val Sanford was uh, getting to be known as quite a lawyer at that time. I always say he's the judge's lawyer. I always say, ask any judge in Tennessee that if he had a matter, who he'd refer it to. And I'm confident it would be to Val Sanford. And uh, Lawyer Gullet, as we called him, was getting older, but he was still around. And uh, he was, uh, he was uh, uh, again, a an encourager. And we beginning add, begin you know, to add people. We try not to add people just for the sake of adding lawyers, but we really needed them at that time. That's the time we added, for instance, uh, old Wesley Turner, who's with us today, and then others, fo uh, others um, uh, followed that. So we were up, uh, give or take a few, counting the of council here in the neighborhood of, of 30 today, as I recall. Exactly. And Wesley... Um uh, was one of the people who began working primarily in property transactions. That's correct, real property. Right. Mm -hmm. He came here wanting to do that and, uh, and had this uh, a marvelous opportunity to do that with Metropolitan Federal. And yep. I think today is the best property lawyer in Nashville, right. if not the state. And then that's one thing that I've noticed that you did over the years. You found ways to, to get leaders in different areas of the law to join the firm. And I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, so that what, when, you, when you ended up with a firm that uh, we have today, it has a number of different departments in it. Yeah. And you know what we had in mind always was to get good people. And uh, they needed to be good lawyers too, but particularly good people. 
I know uh, secretaries in the old days, particularly some of them who had never been in a law firm before and who would interview, they had some concern about working for a law firm. And I would, and as I'd interview them, I'd say, now, you know, we could take the ceiling. Uh, for, fin for confidential reasons, we can't do this, but we just lift the ceiling off our law firm here and just let all the world look in, and we would never be embarrassed by anything that happens here, whether what it's said or what we've done. And, uh, and uh, when you get people, you know, that carry on as a team and are uh, community leaders and, uh, and uh, active in the community, and um, while law is important to them, other things in the community are important too, you know, you get good people, and we've been very fortunate here in the years, I think, of really getting not only good lawyers, but, but lawyers that are people. You know, uh, always uh, told that Bear Bryant, in the days when there was unlimited recruiting for football in colleges, uh, he would wind up each year with, uh, you know, with a dozen and a half quarterbacks, and you can only play one at, one at a time. And they said, we don't understand that. He says, the best player is always a quarterback. I can put him any way I want him. We looked at that in hiring people. We hired good people, and you can put them learning law in different departments. Uh, back when I started, you know, there were no such things as, at least in Nashville, as specialized law. Everybody were, you know, you, if you were a lawyer, you could handle anything that was involved. And as time uh, uh, progressed, we found that uh, somebody could do real estate better, like. Uh, like Wesley Turner, somebody could do probate le better like we did, somebody could do litigation better and emphasize that and so we informally and then formally departmentalized as have virtually all the other firms in Nashville. I think one of the big um, um, moments in the history of the Gullet, Sanford, Robinson and Martin firm was when uh, uh, you sort of merged with the, the firm that Joe Martin had been in, is that correct? Yes, I'd say that I'd say the uh, the biggest event was when you came over, Gary. Well, <laughs> out, other than that, other than that, yeah, uh, um. when you and Scott Derry came over, there's no question about that. But then also uh, when um, Ray Busey and uh, Joe Martin and uh, Tom Forrester and um, Linda Knight came over, and uh, that all fit in well. You know, a lot of times these things don't fit. We've never done one that didn't fit. Right. But these things fit in, in well, and uh, you know we try to. We try not to, uh, I don't guess we are as, uh, we're, we're the ones that really don't have big uh, letters uh, that proclaim where our law firm is <laughs> or, or do uh, advertising in the phone book and that sort of thing. We're sort of low key, have always been that way. And uh, I, think, uh, I think that every person here is prouder, not of himself, but of every other lawyer and boosts them. And I think that's what makes it go. I think you're right. You know, I would be remiss um, in in this trip through your career not to ask you about the Nashville Bar. Tell us a little bit about, um, first of all, the what you've seen in the evolution of the bar and the parts you've played in okay. that. I think when I first came here, there was about 400 members of the Nashville Bar. I think it's closer to 3,000 today. And after I'd been here three or four years, I was elected to the... Uh, uh, board of directors of the Nashville Bar Association and I think there were just uh, I believe there were just three elected each year then for three-year terms we met in the little bar library over in the Stallman building and then uh, and then uh, later uh, in uh, I guess about 79 or 80 I was elected again for a three-year term and then in 1982 uh, served as president of the Nashville Bar Association I think in 1982 there were two things that I was interested in that we were able to succeed in, and that uh, was to establish a pro bono program, a uh, pro bono program that had been bannered around a little bit in Nashville, and the older lawyers particularly were not excited about it at all. And uh, they were saying we couldn't do it, we can't do it, but uh, we did a lot of work. We went to other communities to see what, what they did, and starting on May 1st, of 1982 with about uh, 200 plus lawyers signed up we pulled off the pro bono program and the other thing was the uh, was the was the civil jury system here uh, I was uh, over at the courthouse and I and uh, and it, it occurred to me that each court first circuit court second circuit court third circuit court they call their own jurors didn't make a lot of sense and um, 
and it was just a mishmash situation. So it occurred to me, why don't we, uh, is there a way that we can, can smooth that? So I uh, got Betty Nixon, who was on the, um, on the Metropolitan Council at that time, to uh, get approved a $25,000 uh, grant uh, that was used to go to um, the um, uh, U.S. Court Center. That's not the right name, but it's in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, who studies courts and so forth. So we worked with them during that year, and they came up with the idea of what we have now. And I think our jury system works extremely well. I had uh, no idea you had a part the, uh, in, in the that uh, general courts, pool. That's right. They're, they're pooled and uh, they are uh, well instructed. Uh, if you're not going to serve that day, you're called usually before and told. And uh, I notice letters to the editor just uh, anytime anybody serves about once a month about how they enjoyed uh, that service on, um, on, the, uh, on the jury. Before that time, people would call and if the, I mean people would come uh, to the individual courts and if they weren't being used, they'd just sit down there maybe for a week. You know, it didn't make sense. And uh, so those were two highlights, I think. And since and um, since that time, I've you know not been. Uh, and then I started. Uh, there are three of us that started the uh, the uh, bar newspaper. Uh, John um, Parker and myself and um, and John McLemore, and I named it the Docket, which it, it kept that name for a long time. Now it's the, the National Bar Journal. So that's my uh, that's my history of the National Bar Association. When you were president in the early 80s, um, did you have much staff to work with? No, I uh, had, uh, had uh, <clears throat> virtually none. Uh, there came with a new president a, um, a secretary who was most of the time part-time, and so she just moved right in the office where the, uh, where the um, president was, and uh, no staff other than that, and uh, everything was done the president did, really. What little was done, I might add. We didn't have any great uh, CLE programs and things of that nature. And uh, the secretary that we had, and that we had for several years, she always wanted to talk all the time. So I arranged how to take care of that. We had two floors at the time, moved her up on one floor, and I was on the other floor. And set a time, you know, at 11.45 each day, we'd talk for 15 minutes and see what needs to be done. So that was the extent of the staff, and uh, that was changed uh, three or four uh, years later, and we have a. You've been president of the National Bar Association. We've had a, have a good working association now, don't we? We really do, and and uh, I, I think what's most striking is you served at a time when there was no executive director. That's right for the bar. That's and, correct. And later, we've of course have built not only an executive director, but a staff there. Um, Jack, unless I am wrong. You also have done some yeoman's work for the Tennessee Bar, am I correct? Well, yes, um, I was a general counsel there for, uh, for a few years, and I was the second general counsel, mm -hmm. and, um, and then I got someone else to take it over. <laughs> who, was, who preceded you um, in that job? Help me with that name. I'm not sure. Help I'm, me that name. I'm not positive. Oh, I, no. I know that Hal Harden. No, it's Hal. Was it Hal? Hal Harden was the um, was the first general counsel, and how he how that developed is that some problems developed, particularly with the uh, director yeah. of the Tennessee Bar Association, and pretty serious. And he was called in to uh, view the situation, to make recommendations, and so forth. And then, as a result, they said, "From here on, we want you to be our general counsel." And uh, so, uh, and uh, he was for several years, and did a good job. And then I succeeded him. Going back for just a minute, um, tell us a little bit about, you mentioned your son Jack Jr. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your family and where, they've, where you've lived and, and your children and, okay. and what they've done. Well, I've told you about my wife, uh, Claudine, and uh, we're, uh, if we, uh, we've been married 56 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've lived uh, in the Green Hills section of um, Nashville, and uh, this is the 41st year we've lived in the same house. Uh, following, and it's a beautiful home. Following, it's, it's got three acres. Following uh, that, um, following Jack's uh, Junior's birth, six years later, his uh, brother Philip uh, was born, and uh, so we have the uh, 
we have the uh, two sons, and then I have uh, one granddaughter. That's uh, Jack's uh, daughter, Ashley. And that'll be the only grandchild that we'll have because Philip and his uh, wife uh, married uh, when they were in their 40s, early 40s, and they decided not to have children, probably wisely. And so, uh, and uh, Jack is not married now, so Ashley is it, it seems. Uh, what, you know, I know Jack well because I practice with Jack and handle cases with him, but tell us a little bit about Philip uh, okay. and what Phil he's done. Philip is an engineer, uh, the title of professional engineer. And uh, since the time he's gotten out of, co out of college, he's worked for the uh, United States government. And he continues to do that. Uh, he used to um, uh, go, uh, and he still does from time to time, he used to do more traveling than he does now from different places in the world. <clears throat> he was in uh, Hong Kong, he and his wife for two years, I guess uh, finished uh, two or three years ago. And we were over there to see him while he was there. And then later, uh, Jack and uh, his daughter were there to see him. And you mentioned uh, your granddaughter, Ashley, and I believe she is uh, currently in college, is that That's correct? right. She's finishing her second year in college. And uh, she goes to Pepperdine University. Mm -hmm. And this year, uh, both terms, she has been in, uh, studying in London. And while there, she's been going to different places. She just got an email from her. She just got back from Ireland last week. And, and uh, those kids there travel different places on the continent. Jack, um, I am certain from practicing with you that I know pretty much what your your political history is. You're a Democrat uh, through and through. Have you served in any public uh, offices? Have not. Have not. And did you ever think about that? I did before I came back. And I had to make a decision whether I wanted to do that or whether I wanted to practice law. And um, so... Uh, and if I and if I wanted to, because that would make a difference on where I was going to practice law. If I wanted to uh, follow, let's say, uh, Gore in Congress and in the Senate, uh, I'd go to a small town, probably Carthage. It's a political little town, always has been, and practice there. And uh, and if and if uh, if it developed where I could, I ultimately would run for Congress and see and to see what happened, or perhaps something else. But I decided not to, and so I came to uh, Nashville in this law firm, and so I uh, decided that I would not, I would vote in every election, which I've done since I'm 21, even when I was in the Army when it was difficult. I've never missed voting in an election, but I've never held public office, no however I sought it. You have done a great deal in the community, and um, if you would take just a moment and tell us about some of the things you've done in community life outside of law practice? Well, uh, I've been um, active over the years in uh, what's called the Green Hill Civitan Club since 1964. Been on the board, been president, uh, been quite active in uh, our church, and uh, I've served uh, as um, chairman of deacons twice in two different churches. Uh, I've been Sunday school uh, teacher there and continue to be and uh, been uh, pretty much wrapped up in that. Um, I'm on the, uh, I was a founding member of the um, Supreme Court Historical Society and continue to serve as a, uh, as a director there and uh, been involved in other, you know, kind of law related activities and other civic projects from time to time, but those are the big ones. Looking back at Nashville and what you've seen over your career, um, what impact did the metropolitan form of government have on Nashville? I think a wonderful and a tremendous one. Uh, you look at other cities that, are, that have duplication of efforts and officers, and you wonder, you know, why didn't they do that? And uh, I think Nashville led the way, and uh, there are a few others, not many others in the country, that have this now. But... Uh, it uh, it succeeded here, and I think that was uh, I think that uh, was the key to a lot of the Nash of the Nashville development in recent years. As a person who wasn't really born in Nashville but came to Nashville um, sort of later in life, uh, have you enjoyed living here? Oh, certainly, yeah, yeah. Enjoyed my neighbors, the neighborhood. Uh, uh, enjoyed uh, the law firm. Just really have enjoyed uh, law practice. 
and uh, enjoyed um, uh, being a part of the community, uh, the churches particularly, and those kind of things. Who else, um, during your, your um, practice of law and your work in government and in, um, in the community, is there anyone else who has really had a marked impact on you or that um, you remember some good stories you'd like to share? Well, the ones that have the, imp the biggest impact are the three men that I named that I called uh, cheerleaders. But, you know, my, uh, uh, the people I, that I practice with every day have. And whether that's a lawyer that's been here for six months or has been here for six years, you know, there's something I can learn from them and appreciate from them. And, uh, and uh, not only you, Gareth, I look up to you, but, but to others too. And um, in the, uh, uh, the um, I would say Bill Sherman, Dr. Bill Sherman, who for mm -hmm. years was pastor at uh, Woodmont Baptist Church and is a, sort of a community leader. He and I continue to be uh, good friends. Uh, he would be one outside of the uh, uh, of law that I would. Uh, my father died five years after I started practicing in 1969. Uh, my brother died four or five years ago, and as I say, he was 11 years older, and uh, and we were you know really good friends. We were different. He's someone who could do anything with his head and with his hands, and so I'd have to say he was an influence, and uh, not in Nashville, but away from here. Looking back over the last um, oh, 40 or 50 years, Jack, how, uh, to you, from your perspective, how has law practice changed? It's changed a lot. Uh, and uh, the development of uh, all the different kinds of machineries, the cell phones, the email, the faxes, all that kind of thing, you know, and, and it's uh, probably just made it more complicated. I would get a call from somebody, Jack, I'd like you to take a look at this contract and see what you say about it. And all I'd have to say back then, all right, just put it in the mail, and when it gets here, I'll take a look at it, and I'll give you a call. Now when I say that, they say, it'll be there in 10 minutes, <laughs> exactly. either by fax or email, and that exactly. puts the pressure on you, you know. It does. And uh, we have more lawyers here, uh, obviously, as I've said. Um, and as a result, I don't think that you have the uh, continuity and the... Uh, the good feeling among all the lawyers, as you as as we had back then, because you knew virtually every one of them, and now you don't know. Uh, as you and I have talked before, when you get to know somebody, uh, it's it's a different situation. When you've just heard about somebody, you know you you don't know whether they have horns or not. So uh, I've I've seen uh, and and we're more and uh, we're wed to the uh, wed to the uh, to the billing hour. And, uh, you know, uh, you sort of feel guilty when you sit in your office uh, with your feet up. And I've heard, I'm telling you the stories that I've heard all around town, you know. And uh, so sometimes you feel that the law practice is running you instead of you're running the law practice. I've seen and, that change. And I think you and I have talked about the good impact that the National Bar has had. Uh, absolutely. In trying to keep lawyers yeah. collegial. Absolutely. And I think of, uh, uh, I hear other lawyers talk from other places and... Uh, I think the Nashville Bar Association is just really a wonder. And we're just so, it's been so well run in the years since it was finally organized, Gareth. <laughs> uh, we can be proud of that. Looking back, you mentioned that you considered a career in politics rather than law. Do you ever second guess? No, never have, never have. And I think if somebody considered uh, a career in politics, what they should do is to get established in some other field and then if it develops that they feel the urge to run, then they should do so. They should make it a, start out making a career. They need, some, uh, they need some experience. If you could change anything in the political scene that, you, that played such a prominent part in your early life, anything that you would suggest to a young person going into politics? Well, I think uh, I see now that uh, I don't like to see our country so divided. Uh, we have the Supreme Court divided five to four often. Uh, we have the, um, we have the uh, uh, both houses of um, Congress divided almost evenly. Uh, the state legislature, legislature's the same way. And, uh, 
And you know, in order to govern, we've got to give along. We've got to give a little bit. A compromise is not an ugly, is not an ugly, ugly word. And uh, you and I have talked about it, that when uh, Lyndon Johnson was the uh, majority leader of the Senate, and uh, Everett Dirksen was the minority leader of the House, now sometimes they would change that because uh, sometimes Republicans would be elected and the Democrats wouldn't. But they were the leaders of their parties, and uh, everything got along famously in Washington at that time because they were friends. And uh, they worked it out. It was worked out before it came for a vote, really. And, but they had the country foremost in mind, and uh, if somebody had to give a little bit here and a little bit there, you know, that's fine. But I don't see that today. So I say that uh, people who are interested in, in uh, politics, I think they need to have an, an open mind that uh, I think when you get in a lot of times, you think everything is black and white, and it's not black and white. And, uh, and I'm afraid that uh, we give so much attention to, today to people in public office, not only them, but to their families, to their children, to their spouses, <clears throat> that we're running off good people who otherwise would, would be willing to be in public office. Today, we probably don't have the best people that we could in public office because they don't want their... They don't want the spotlight on their spouses. They don't want the spotlight on their children. Uh, and the press used to not be that way. Yep. Exercise that same wisdom for young lawyers. What advice, um, if you were counseling with a young lawyer today about careers and, and what to expect, what would be your advice? Well, I would say this. I would say in, uh, in uh, pre-law, uh, consider taking a lot of English writing courses. You know, lawyers come apart, come, uh, uh, we present ourselves best today in writing. There's, there's less vocal. And I'd say learn to be a good writer. Okay. Uh, English grammar was, was always my favorite subject. And uh, I'd say prepare yourself that way. And then have a, a, uh, a broad uh, breadth of uh, other subjects that you would take. And, uh, and obviously, in my day, we didn't serve as clerks in, uh, in law offices. And I would say if they have opportunities to do that today, to see how they'll run. I didn't have that opportunity. Jack, this has been a fascinating um, trip into a fascinating career. Is there anything else that um, we need to talk about or that you would like to? No, I would say this. In the very beginning, I'd say this to young lawyers. When people would call me and say, Jack, I've got a problem, or Jack, you know, I'm concerned about this, I always, my response always been, I hope I can help you. I hope I can help you. And, uh, and I think they need to hear that because that's, we are a helping profession, really. That's what we're supposed to be here for. And uh, I would say that they need to adopt that attitude and really you know, express that to the client. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to take part in our project, Jack. Uh, we appreciate you very much, and I know the National Bar shares that sentiment. Thank, Thank you, you, Gary. It's been a great pleasure for you to be the one who asked the questions. Thank you.